let's let's swamp. Oh my goodness! Look at that. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much for that Thank sub, Black Thank you so Bull. much for the sub. Boy. <laughs> what the heck? Isn't that what crazy? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the alert so we don't get interrupted all the time. Guys, welcome to the stream. Jake Lures, Tim Lambesis. Hey, guys. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course, dude. It's a big, big honor. Wait. What's wait, up, Jake? Wait. <laughs> What's up? Uh, wait, wait. <laughs> further. Okay. You can't not talk about what just happened. What the heck was that? I, I feel like we can not talk about it. Let's just move on. Oh my gosh. What was that someone throwing delivering a package yeah. to someone? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That that's our that's our buddy Morgan. That's, that's our, our friend Morgan. Morgan. Yeah. And so what does that signify? What what what, what was that? There's that this happened? song um by this band. Um what was their there it's called uh, August something something by August and there's this part in the song where he says deliver the sentence, right? It's pretty crazy. So like you know how like People deliver stuff like the UPS man or whatever. It's kind of like that, but he throws the box at at him. It's like a sentence. <laughs> so Tim, how, how how's everything going? Man? What you been up to? Frozen or not? I think is he is he really just like mean dogging us that that hard? I think he I think he just happened to freeze while he doing. Might that. Might have frozen at that moment. Oh my god! It was gosh. perfect. <laughs> oh man. Oh my gosh. I can tell we're already having issues with my internet. Yeah, I yeah, probably yeah. want to do that move. Move into the other oh, place. Oh man. Man. Okay. Let's <laughs> move on. Let's, Let's just move on. I, I didn't know if like if it was like what it is. <laughs> Poor Jake. Hey, Dan and Casey, I just want to say you guys are, look really good and stable over there. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, you look good, too. Look, looking, thanks. Looking nice. Dude, I love your studio setup. It looks, it's like everything I wish my background looked like and not my bedroom. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's sick, dude. Yeah, I just put flooring on a on a wall here, so it's like. Oh, dude, yeah, we know. did that. We did that, too, in our in our old studio. It's a oh, great way yeah, to do it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, is this, yeah. Is this better? It seems it better. Not, well, no, seems it's better. Not. I, I, we can hear you, but we can't see you really. Can you see me? No. Poor like Jake. at all? I mean, we can see a frozen picture of you. Oh, my yeah. God. oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, coming back. He gone. Hold on. So, um, Tim, what what you been up to since uh, you know being home and quarantine and all that stuff? So this is the longest my beard's ever been, which is not that long, but just for me it's long. And yeah. uh, been growing, growing a little bit of a beard. Been uh, doing a lot of home remodeling, fixing, just all the stuff that I uh, never had time to get to before. Yeah, dude. And uh, yeah, so man, tip tend the tool man, I guess. What's what? <laughs> what's the most dad status thing you fixed um, recently? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Well, I, I had to rent. Uh, an insulation blower from Home Depot, and then it reinsulated my attic. So that was pretty. pretty That's dad pretty dad. Status. That is yeah. pretty dad. <laughs> That's pretty dad. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. How about you, Jake? What have you been up to, staying home? Uh, well, I just took Winston on his very first motorcycle ride on the Yamaha R6. Nice. Wow. Yeah, it was awesome. I, I found this. Um, like dog carrier on Amazon that you strap onto your your chest and then he like fits in it. Dude. And then he rides in the front, like literally like an, in front of me like this on the tank and I can ride him around. That's so rad. Do you like it? I yeah. think I, I might try to get one of those. That sounds great. He loves it, dude. I'll, I'll send you <laughs> I'll send you a link, Tim, and I'll send you guys. That's actually the video that I sent you, Dan, on your phone. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so it's it's he liked it. We took it nice and slow around the block because it was his first time. I didn't want to scare him, like, you know, going from zero to sixty in three point, you know, one seconds. But yeah, um, yeah. 
he he thoroughly enjoyed it and uh it was like 30 bucks on amazon so yeah dude like the little harness i love yeah, that stuff it's cool so good yeah he's the best that's so that's awesome. what i've been doing yeah nice yeah, it's Very been cool. good yeah well wanted to say uh thank you to both you guys for for taking the time out of your day to uh hang out with us and chat and it is uh just a, a privilege to hang out with you guys um and uh i know you you guys i don't know if you can you can see what what our chat is saying here but if i see any questions um that i feel like are you know pertinent to the conversation i'll just i'll bring those up or whatever um otherwise we can go ahead and get started on our topic today uh which is uh actually T Tim chose this, wanted to talk about substance abuse. And um, I understand that that's probably, um, you know, a sensitive topic here, but that's that's what we do here. We kind of take these uh, otherwise, I don't know, uncomfortable topics and situations and um, make them make them normal because that's what we feel is is healthy for people and bringing those things into the light uh, helps. So um, Tim, why did you why did you choose to to pick this? Let's just kind of start this off with you, and and we'll we'll have a conversation here. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge crossover between uh, substance abuse and mental health. You know, a lot of times you, you mentioned because people don't talk about it, so a lot of substance abuse comes from um, people trying to self medicate, or uh, you know, just they don't have a an, an issue in their life they're comfortable talking about, and so they try to drown it in some sort of substance, or or there's just you know people that. Um, get into it because they, you know, they, they had an injury and they got prescribed an opiate or something. And then they don't view themselves as a traditional addict, you know, because they, they still wear a suit to work or whatever it is, you know? And so it's just yeah. a, a topic that gets hidden. Yeah, for sure. Man. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's something like, I know, like what, what you were saying is some people don't view themselves as a, as a traditional addict, addict, like, um, I feel like a lot of the time, even if, even if somebody's like pretty far down, down the road, like it, it's kind of hard to notice, like, you know, when, when maybe, maybe it happens like a little bit at a time, it's hard to notice like, man, this is like, that's what my life is. I'm, I'm addicted to this substance. Like, this is kind of like my, my crutch. And, uh, you know, if, if I think it's important that we talk about this just because, some people don't don't even notice it, you know. I feel like that happens yeah. with a lot of things. Yeah, and uh, you know, like I mentioned, the crossover with mental health. I mean, I don't know the statistic, you know, recently, but the, uh, you know, I, I guess they call it comorbidity or, uh, you know, dual diagnosis, and and a lot of times, you know, somebody will have will have one issue, and they're afraid to talk about maybe that, and so that they end up hiding them both, and then and then and then it sort of compounds and, and becomes an even even bigger uh even bigger issue yeah yeah well I, i'm i'm excited to see what like what casey was saying earlier what everyone kind of brings from our own context our own experience uh regarding this subject and i just want to let everyone here know uh who's watching if, if you want to share something in chat like that's totally okay um as long as it is just respectful and and we want to keep this a safe place you know um because not not very many people have um safe places to go to discuss this kind of thing and that's like our our mission you know is to make these things comfortable to talk about um so just to kind of get us started off here like how how would you know if you're even <laughs> abusing a substance like just start with that and we'll can maybe start with tim then we'll go to jake and we'll kind of round it out from there yeah, so I think the uh, what what's considered kind of the the accepted answer within the medical community is if it if you continue to do something regardless of the negative consequences, you know. So, um, I mean, if you technically, you know, people will have um, food addictions even, you know, because like say they they continue to eat a food even though they know it's destroying a relationship in their life or their or their uh, their health or something, you know. If if you do those things despite the negative consequences, yeah. Um, that that's officially an addiction hmm. yeah i think i've seen it can you guys hear me i just want to make sure yep, that I'm, we're good. I'm alive yeah we're good thank god i'm alive okay um yeah i mean i i i feel like you 
struggle with because I've struggled with substance abuse before, and like basically a lot of people that I was raised with and surrounded by abuse substances all the time. I mean, it was just kind of like that's what you did. Like where I came from, people were drinking all the time or doing drugs all the time, or you know, and it was it was kind of just normalcy. It was like what people did, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. But for for me, like a healthy thing for me to gauge that because I have a very addictive personality. Uh, so I can I can abuse a lot of things if I choose to. I could abuse riding my motorcycle or playing video games or uh, studying, uh, you know, theology. Um, you know, it's really like abusing something. So it's like what I do to gauge that for myself personally is I go, OK, um, how much am I thinking about this thing? How much time am I investing in it? Um, is it? changing my perspective or outlook on other things in my life yeah do i feel like i'm doing this in moderation or do i have balance like you can make kind of like a checklist for yourself and realize you know because every everybody thinks substance abuse really just goes around drugs and alcohol but there's a lot of other things out there that you know um that can easily become uh, a problem you know for you Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that we're talking specifically on substances, but just to gauge this in your life, you know, you can make your own like kind of rule book and kind of check in with these things. Also listen to people who are really close to you. Uh, like if someone's like, Hey man, like you've been drinking a lot lately. Like you need to listen to that. You know, yeah. like mm -hmm. that person is, they don't have to say anything. Matter of fact, probably 90% of people that are your friends aren't going to say anything mm. but then the 10 percent that actually truly care or or maybe feel like they're tired of seeing it because they're tired of seeing you hurt yourself say something like you should listen to that right like because they're saying that because they care they they love you or they they want to see you healthy right um you know those are the ways to really for me to gauge it and when i was uh, when I was going through my divorce, like I was abusing alcohol, like a lot. And I think even in the past with that, I was drinking a lot. Cause like I said, I was around people that that's what we did. We worked really hard and we drank really hard. Mm -hmm. And like, that was like kind of the way we live life. Yeah. Um, so I was already kind of like, that was a part of normalcy to me was abusing alcohol. Um, and I didn't see really the problem with that. But then when I went through my divorce, I mean, it was really, really bad. It was like 15 drinks a night. And I would, um, and that's just at one bar, you know, I would try to stumble home to go to other bars before they all closed. Um, and I get to a point where I didn't even know where I was. Like I got lost in my own street. Uh, and so, you know, obviously when you're abusing something, um, you know, there's, there, I think there is this place in your spirit that basically says, hey, man, like, this isn't okay. And that's where people feel the shame, they feel the conviction, they feel the guilt. And then they're scared to talk about it, because now they've realized that there is an issue. And have they had an issue all along and all these other people think that they've got a problem. And now kind of makes them a little, little more concerned on how to like open up and share about it, you know, or at least for some people, it kind of depends on, you know, your personality. Um, but yeah, I think that those are all just like, you know, things where it's like, just because you view it normal or you were raised to do this doesn't mean that it's okay or that it's right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah normal doesn't, yeah. doesn't equal right. You know, it's just, that's the, the environment that, that you're in that you're exposed to a lot you know sure yeah yeah i think the fear fear a lot of times comes from uh the things it brings to the surface as well like you were talking about you know when you're drinking a lot but then you're also going through a divorce and a lot of the the emotional feelings you were feeling with that like when when you finally probably realize hey i, I drink a little too much and then it's like oh but if i'm going to talk about this now i have to talk about the reason behind it it's because i'm trying to bury these other feelings and then that's scary too so it's like a compounded um very very difficult thing and makes you feel very vulnerable to to bring up both topics yeah yeah 100 percent. i mean that's the that's the most challenging part is like especially when i think society tells you like 
you know, you're, you're the one who's, you're the man, you know, you're your own God, like, you're going to succeed. And if you, you know, you have to succeed, you have to be this, you have to be that. So when we, when we run into real, real life issues and struggles, it's, it's not really encouraged for us to open up and share about our weaknesses and our flaws. Like, I mean, like you just said, you're like, both of those things are really challenging for someone to admit or to open up and share. And, but we've created that's our society has created that, you know, where heart supports in a place where we're trying to say, Hey, like you don't have to feel this way and you don't have to take it all alone. But yeah, it's, I think, um, and I know that I veered off a little too far from the, the question, which was, you know, how do you know you, you struggle with the substance, but, um, you know, to go back to that is, uh, you know, really to engage yourself, self-reflect, maybe make a list of checks and balances, um, and then ask a friend. Like, if you think that maybe something's going on, you should ask a friend. Be like, hey, like, I just want to make sure, like, when I drink, like, do I drink too much? Or am I getting out of hand? You know? Or like, have yeah. you seen anything in this? I just, I just, I'm just double checking here, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that for uh, for a lot of people struggling with addiction, and and like in the recovery community, you hear the t- the phrase uh, "rock bottom," and a lot of that is just because for somebody struggling with with addiction, until it becomes really really obvious what the negative consequences are, they're just not willing to admit it. You know what I mean? So it's like, like, like say for instance, you you know you miss you miss like a, a rent or mortgage payment. That that might be like enough for the average person to be like, oh man, I've got an issue. I've spent all my money this month on on drugs or alcohol. Yeah. But for most people, that, when they're in the middle of it, that's not enough of a negative consequence for them to be like, hey, you know, like that was that was a red flag. Like, so then they have to like miss rent for multiple months and rock bottom becomes like getting evicted or something like that, you know, or or, or worse. And I think that um, what I, I would want to encourage people to do is to raise the floor on what that rock bottom is. You know, you can hit a lower rock bottom. You could just <laughs> be the guy who misses rent one month and is like, wow, that was enough for me, you know, like um, yeah. but rock bottom yeah. is also is all, is all relative. So. Like in a situation where for one person missing rent for a month is enough to um, to turn them around. And for another person, they've got to, you know, lose all their friends and their family and their their yeah. home, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Man. Yeah. It's like yeah. I, I, I kind of think about like, you know, on like a cartoon or a TV show or something. It's like, all right, which path should we take? Like, let's take like the bright path with like rainbows and everything or this dark path where like there's wolves, you know. And it's like <laughs> you could stop right there when you notice like look at all this stuff that's ahead of me. You know, you don't have to run in and get eaten by wolves like that. You you just don't have to do that, you know? And it seems like, you know, if you love your addiction enough, um, that it, it, it's kind of to that point where it has to, it has to like tip the scale to where like, okay, this is bad enough to kick me out of it. But like, you know, I, I love what you said. Like you can raise the floor of that rock bottom. Like you don't have yeah. to go down that road. And I feel like sometimes we, we feel like there's no helping us until it's to rock bottom. Like we can't do anything about ourselves until we're just at the worst, you know, that's not true. Yeah. I think when I was working as a case manager, um, an addiction treatment place, one of the hardest clients I had to deal with was somebody who, um, you know, his business was still successful. He still had plenty of money in the bank. You know, he still kind of had that general sense of entitlement and, Mm -hmm. um, it was really, really hard for him to even admit that that you know his substance abuse was was having a negative impact on his life. And and it was like, dude, just because your money is is in a good place doesn't mean that you're emotionally or, or spiritually or mentally in a good place. And um, you know, you can't really say it exactly in those terms when you're somebody's case manager. Or sometimes you can. It depends on the on the client. But um, it's just really hard, you know, when when somebody views themselves as as successful in in you know, maybe the, the traditional terms of like, like finances, you know, because I think life is so much more of a balance than that. And, and that's where I think a lot of people who are wondering whether or not they're struggling with addiction is to, to assess like your entirety, you know, like how are, how is your mental state, your financial state, your emotional state? I mean, even physically. And that's why I mentioned like, you know, food is kind of uh, a common addiction because it takes such a physical toll on people. And, and, um, a lot of people aren't really willing to recognize that as a, uh, as, as an addiction because they, they generally, generally speaking are, are still functioning in life. Mm. Yeah. 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 I mean, justification goes a long way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, 
it's so easy to justify. And I think that's where the problem is with like the rock bottom is that people justify things so that they don't feel like they're hitting a rock bottom. You know, it's like, Oh, right. well, I couldn't pay my mortgage because I had bought drinks, but also like I ended up, you know, going out to, to get food uh, a few more times. And I had to, you know, throw 20 bucks to go get Winston, his dog food or whatever. You know what I mean? Like there's so many ways to try to justify not having that rock bottom. And a lot of people, you know, they never hit rock bottom. I mean, like they basically when there's an addiction to such a, such a degree, it's like you're married to that addiction. Yeah. And yeah, you don't want to divorce that addiction because it's been there for you mm -hmm. for so long. And sure. Sure. has been your best friend. I mean, think about, let's think about what we go to, why we go to things when, when we're, if we're addicted to them, like, all right, I'll use my, myself, for example, like, you know, I would use alcohol as my friend. Like if I was alone or felt lonely, I would drink. If I was, if I um, was successful in like a business transaction or, you know, a tour or whatever, I would celebrate with alcohol. Um, you know, if I was angry, um, if I had a long day, I would go to the bar and relax. Right. So like, I kind of put alcohol in this position to be my best friend hmm. and to help me through all of these difficult or not difficult moments of my life because it felt good because it was normal to, for me because um, you know, maybe because when I was growing up, you know, you always see on the TV, you know, the tough guy, the hero who's, you know, at the bar drinking, like, like I can think of one right now, lethal weapon, dude. Yeah, dude. Uh, freaking what's his name? Mel like Gibson. A, yeah. Mel Gibson was a raging alcoholic in that movie. I yeah. loved that movie. And like, he was a badass, right? So like, you know, um, some people think, you know, drinking is, you know, sophisticated, like, oh, look at me with my, you know, Chardonnay or, yeah, or, yeah. or, you know, they think they're tough or cool or, you know, so like, there's so many things that our addiction or substances can give us that we put them in place of other things for comfort and for, um, you know, stability, stability right. Yeah. Security. Yeah. And, and, and that's, so when you're, so when someone says, Hey man, you have a problem, you immediately get offended because a, you know, you don't want to hear that B who's this guy telling you and C it's something that is precious to you. It, yeah. can, it must, it has something special for you or right. you have some intimate connection with this substance um, because it's reliable. And the problem is that your spirit knows that this is not okay. That's why you go and you get convicted and you have shame and guilt because your spirit says, this isn't good, but your mind says, this is where you go. Mm -hmm. Your neurological pathways of your brain are signaling, Hey man, when you're lonely, we go, we drink. That's how we get away. That's how we escape this. That's how we survive. Yeah. But then your spirit goes, this is not okay. This is not okay. This isn't who I am. I'm not an alcoholic or I'm not a, addict or I'm not a, you know, whatever. Um, and, and that's the struggle, but, um, you know, uh, again, I'm rambling so much cause I'm just thinking about all. No, this I, the, you're not rambling. That's the, the, the relationship analogy is, is actually one of the most perfect analogies because you don't know somebody in a toxic relationship and they'll, they'll like vent about the person they're with all day long and just like how terrible that person is. Then as soon as you talk trash about that person, they get defensive and say, Hey, <laughs> Hey, that's my boyfriend or that's my girlfriend or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that's like that's like being a friend bringing up substance abuse to somebody is it's like they they become aware of it because they start to complain like oh i feel so hung over this morning or oh you know like i have no more money or you know and they complain about it but as soon as you say hey dude i think you got a problem they're like whoa 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 hold on that's my that's my boyfriend right there like because you know yeah. like yeah. because it really is it's like like you said jake it's like that person that's been there through all your all your good times your celebrations and all your darkest times you know and Sure. Um, that analogy is is like something that that's just becoming more and more important and useful, especially with the. There's different studies showing like there's a there's a really famous study they call it Rat Park where 
where you have all these rats that are um, they're essentially in, in a situation where they have a little feeder that's cocaine on one side and then a feeder that's water oh, on the I've other side. Yeah, yeah. And when they're, when they're yeah. by themselves, they, they have this very strong relationship with the cocaine feeder. And, and essentially, they'll, they'll actually go up to the point of overdosing. And but then you put them in this like crazy, you know, like utopia for rats with like, you know, trees and and all th- kinds of things to climb on and all kinds of other rats in there. And it's, just, it's like a social like relationship oriented um, little enclosure for those rats. And those very same rats will will literally like only maybe one out of like like, you know, only one out of like 50 times go to the cocaine feeder. And, and the other times they'll just go get water because they're they're satisfied. They're in a healthy relationship. Yeah, man. yeah, that's amazing, and that's that's literally what heart support is trying to do. Is like, that's again another I think testimony of of how important and apparent community is for humans. That yeah. we're, like we're supposed to be in community and together, and um, that's how we survive. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. That's how we, you know, are able to make things and and conquer. Right, like. Even I always say, like, the only things I've been successful at in my life have taken a team. You know, like August Burns Red, the reason why that we're so successful and what we do is because everybody is a part of that. And, you know, people are bringing their strengths and weaknesses. We're challenging each other. We're willing to engage one another, share, be yeah. flexible, right? So, like, um, that that's huge. And that's what hard support is for someone who does struggle with substance abuse is the fact that it doesn't matter the color of your skin, who you're in love with, what you believe, what you've done or what's been done to you, you're accepted at heart support. And in this community, you can take those first initial steps as to like, hey, maybe you can ask us at heart support, do I have a problem? This is kind of what I'm going through right now, you know? Or, hey, if I had a problem, where would I start, right? Like, um, because we need each other to survive. you know, and I yeah. think right now we need each other even more because yeah. of this whole I agree. COVID thing, you know? Yeah. yeah, I don't want the quarantine issue to make people feel like they're that rat that only has two choices, you know what I mean? The the water and <laughs> the cocaine, you know what I mean? So I, I definitely feel like uh, heart sports a, a huge resource for people to feel like they're they're in a, a much bigger, you know, we're still in quarantine, but we're in at least a much bigger enclosure when you have all these resources of, of heart support to reach out to and and all these conversations and, and beyond, beyond like uh, just reaching out for help. I mean, there's the huge aspect within recovery community of, of helping other people too. So like I would say for anybody out there that, that follows heart support, that's not necessarily currently struggling with an addiction of their own, but has the resources to help other people. Like that's a, that's an important part of continuing recovery is to, to pass that along and to be a rock for somebody else. Yes. Yeah. That's a big deal. And also just just up for an individual to have a place where they can openly share about what they're struggling with might lead someone to make a choice to, you know, engage in a healthier lifestyle or go go use some of those resources that are being offered. And um, and so that's, you know, I, I think in, in play with that um, needs needs to be the the concept of vulnerability and being being able to admit like hey, I think I struggle with this because we talked about, okay, go to a friend or whatever. But I know people who um, struggle with a substance abuse. They went to their friends who who were just enabling their abuse. And they were like, no, you're fine, man. No, you're fine. Sleep it off kind of thing. You know, like, oh, you wimp, whatever. And they here, have another beer. That'll help kind of, you know, like those kind of people (laughs) is what essentially like kind of helped help keep my my father in a alcoholic state for a long time he just had people who were also alcoholics that he hung out with and so if you don't step out of that that circle right you're never going to be given the opportunity to gain a different perspective and i think that's really important yeah i guess one potentially positive part of of quarantine at the moment is you're not gonna uh, be as likely to find drinking buddies like your dad was (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's true that's yeah. true so so if, if you can if you can if start by yourself and no one disagrees with you you're left with your own addict personality you that's know that's very true very very true yeah i think i think that um you know acts of service is obviously huge and and what i'm what i've come to realize is that like the decisions that we make even though they live and die through time they still exist because 
they were actions that had some sort of effect on our present day life, right? So like, even if, you know, even if let's say you share with somebody at Heart Supports, the community, and that person doesn't initially go out and just get help, like don't feel discouraged or like that you didn't do anything because that is like one brick that you gave to that person to build their wall of recovery. Whether they see it or not, or know it or not, that act, yeah. even though it was, you know, from 6.30 to 7.30 at night, you writing that letter to that person, them reading it and digesting it, even though it's gone, that moment is still in that person's life. Yeah. And they're, it's never going to leave, right? And so, like, we have a lot of, that's why I say to people, they go, well, if I want to, you know, help somebody, how do I do it? I say, well, they've got to give you the gift of authority. So mm. they have to be willing to say, I'm going to listen to you. So like Tim, Tim is a friend of mine. I love Tim with all my heart. Um, and if I had a problem and I went to Tim, what I'm doing is I'm giving Tim the authority to speak into my life and I'm going to listen. And like, that's a very, very, powerful and precious um, transaction. And literally what he says could very well change the narrative of my life. Yeah, I, I could say, hey man, I yeah. struggle with this. And Tim would say, I understand that um, I love you and I'm, I'm sorry you're going through this. Will you do me a favor and will you just, just go to rehab? Just try rehab, try this rehab facility you know, whatever, right? I'm just giving an example. And I was like, yeah, man, that sounds great. And I went to rehab and it changed my life, right? Like, so, yeah. so just understand that like, when you give us an act of service um, to someone else, like it carries and carries on for a very, very long time and, and is very powerful. And like, that's why community is so important because it's so hard yes. for us with our selfish pursuits and our pride and our, our egos and and our fears um, for us to be able to really lead our lives perfectly or even in better p places when we're in such a hard place. So we need others' perspectives, others' tools, others' strengths and gifts to help nurture us, to help yeah, lead us and guide us. And that's why that's why community is so important, you know, or you're going to be like the rat. And you're going to go to the cocaine when you, when you, when you're alone, you yeah. know, just whatever your cocaine is, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The community aspect of, of heart sport is, I mean, obviously uh, me and, and the, the rest of Asla Dying has been big supporters, you know, for, for the entirety of our, our getting back to, to playing music again, um, part of our career. And, you know, I think that a lot of us, individually the five of us we each felt kind of alone in some of the difficulties we faced during during the time away from from playing in asla dying and we never really collectively talked about it until you know 2017 essentially and uh when we got together and had that sense of community we realized how much quicker healing occurs with community you know and that's that's yeah. one of the reasons why we feel like heart support is so important is that for anybody who's trying to heal from something um i mean it is possible that you could do that with, with a couple of close friends at home, but the larger your community, the quicker the healing usually. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, yeah, that's good, man. Question for you, man. Like what, what, what do you feel like some of the, I mean, we, we've been talking about community, maybe that's the answer, but like, what, what do you feel like um, some of the most important parts of recovering from um, substance abuse is like, what, what are some, some major steps that you feel like people have to take? Um, well, so while, while we're kind of on the topic, the, the guy that, uh, does a Ted talk on, on the rat park, uh, example, he actually, I think he titled it something to the effect of that, um, addiction is, is a connection issue. So a lot of times it's, you know, it's like Jake said, that, that relationship that, that you have, you have that relationship with the substance because there's not healthy relationships in other part of your life. Mm. Um, uh, or, or there's maybe people that are there that want to love you and they're that that are there are healthy relationships available for you but you keep choosing the substance over those relationships but whatever the case is and uh to me the the connection is 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 off it's like you know we're as humans we're meant 
to to have a, a social atmosphere. We're meant to connect with other people. Um, we're meant to 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 experience our like our pains and pleasures together. And when we start to like isolate and and especially when we, I mean, it's one thing to, to have an addiction issue. It's another thing to, to hide that addiction issue because then I think you go further down the rabbit hole when you're secretive about it. And that's a very common thing within addiction as well as the secretiveness. Hmm. Yeah, that's huge, man. I think that's such a great point. Like if you have an addiction issue, you know, chances are, you know, as it's like a relationship, you probably either don't have healthy relationships surrounding you or you do and you just continue to choose the addiction relationship yeah i think that's so huge man that's that's like i mean that's definitely a big part of of mine was i was like super not um accepting of communities like i was very judgmental towards community and like i had just been hurt several times by other people in the past that i just couldn't trust anybody so it's like the only thing i guess i could trust was alcohol because it had been in my life for almost my entire life, you know? So it was like, that's the one, that's the one relationship that's never failed me, even though it's failed me multiple. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you you gotta put that in, in context, right? Like Uh, that it was giving me poor health and destructive to all my outside relationships, Exactly. you know, a waste of money or, you know, screwing with my depressive, you know, bouts of depression or mental state, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Hmm. yeah it's funny. Like you, you remember it, it, it is kind of like that abusive relationship thing. Like you remember the good things and like, you hope that next time it's going to be better, you know, over and over and over and over again. And, and you assume like, Oh, well, um, cause like somebody was saying in chat, like, uh, this, you know, my addiction feels like all I have sometimes, like, like that's all I have. Um, somebody struggling with, uh, with self harms, like, man, sometimes all I have is a blade, you know, like that's all I can really rely on, you know, and you start to look at it of like, okay, this is going to fix all my problems. This is going to be like the constant in my life. And you kind of ignore all the destruction that's happening. And when you're not in a community, like you guys have been talking about, when you don't have those relationships, you don't have anybody to be like, dude, like, do you notice all the terrible things that this is doing to you? And you just ignore those and just go towards the, the things that you think are positive. And man, it's a, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I do think that the relationship, I mean, to keep going on that, that analogy, the relationship um, example is great in, in, this, in the terms of like, that's all somebody has. A lot of times people are afraid to leave a, unhealthy relationship, an actual relationship, you know, because they think that, oh, you know, even though this person is verbally abusive or very, very negative in my life, like if, if I'm not with that, that somebody, I don't have somebody in my life, I'm going to feel alone and I'm going to feel lonely and lonely and weak. And, and the same kind of thing can happen, you know, essentially you're talking about somebody who wrote in about all they feel like they have sometimes is the blade and, 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 you know, of course, that's that's an unhealthy relationship, and of course, like m- my heart goes out to that person in a big, big way. Um, if you're able to break up with that that relationship, if you're able to end that relationship with the blade or whatever substance abuse you're you're dealing with, know that there is somebody better for you out there. There is a a healthy relationship. You are worthy of love, and that's like a a reminder that I think a lot of people forget, and it's easy to forget when you're talking about yourself when. Even the person like say, struggling with cutting, as an example, they would go to somebody else and they say, "Oh, you're totally worthy of love. Like you're you're a beautiful person." They'd be willing to say that to somebody else, but they not they're not willing to say that to themselves. You mm-hmm. know, and so we all need that reminder that that if you're gonna have that breakup with that that substance, that there is something better for you out there. Mm-hmm. Totally, yeah, that's good. That's important, and and there's not there isn't really really much of a difference between one another like we all have feelings we all have a spirit we all have emotions we've all done things that were right and we've all done things that were wrong we've made mistakes we've failed and we've succeeded you know so like that is important to realize like if you're willing to say that to somebody else you should be willing to say that to yourself Mm -hmm. you know like the golden rule treat others how you want to be treated well how about you treat yourself how you treat others 
you know, flip, flip, like reverse that for a second and be like, sure. hey, if you're going to love people, you should love yourself with the same standards and, yeah. and um, motivation. Like that's it. That's super important. And yeah. the well more the more we love ourselves, like not in a selfish or prideful manner, the better we can love others and the better we can receive love. Yeah. You know, like yes. what I what I was talking about the other day, which I think is really crucial is that like, if you don't know what love looks like, you won't know how to receive it and you won't know how to give it, you know? And so when you're in this relationship with the blade and it's conditioning you to tell you that this is how you should be treated, it's very, very challenging to be able to absorb or receive something different, you know? Cause it's like, well, this is what I deserve. And it's like, no, it's not, not even close. You know, you deserve this love that is so much stronger, so much better, so much more positive and full of peace and joy and, and happiness, you know? But yet you're settling for the blade, which, it, which in a sense has taught you in that relationship that this is what you deserve. And it's, it's incorrect. Just like my struggle with alcohol, like, well, that's, it's, this is how I should be loved. And it's completely, it's completely uh, a lie, you know? Yeah. Um, a relatively common practice, again, with, to use tools from the recovery community is um, writing an actual handwritten, like, breakup letter to a substance, you know? Because a lot of times in a, in a physical relationship, you know, somebody will break up, They'll, they'll break up, right? And they'll, they'll miss each other for a few days. And then they'll say, oh, let's get back together. You know, and that's like, a pretty, I mean, everybody's seen somebody in a, in a toxic relationship do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for somebody in that toxic relationship, if you make them write, like, write it down as, as, a, as a breakup letter and then, like, pin it to their fridge or something, you know what I mean? They're going to, every time that, that, that other person tries to come back into their life, they're going to be, oh, no, I remember when I wrote this letter, you know? And so the yeah. same thing can be used for, for substance. Um, to write that and, and write it as if that that's a person, you know, I mean, give it a name, you know, you have a relationship with that substance, you know, so ha make it an intimate letter to like, Hey, we had some good times. There was some times when I acknowledged, I acknowledged why I used the substance in the first place. But in the end, this has become very unhealthy and I need to break up with you because of A, B, yeah. C, and D, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff, man. I love it. That's really cool. Cause it's, it's, forcing a person to take ownership of that decision you yeah. know so often like you said what we've talked about before we can like deflect that responsibility or make excuses to uh to to validate our own um you know misguided trust into something that isn't healthy for us and so when we um when we literally by our own hand write out <laughs> we we are owning that and that's a huge step forward in just coming to terms with what what you're struggling with, what you're feeling might be, you know, affecting your life in a negative way. I think that's that's a huge practical step that literally anyone could do, you know. Yeah. 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 I think and it and it makes it more real too, you know, like I mm. I've like getting getting more and more into you know, nerding out about why, why people do habits and like how to build habits and, and that kind of thing. And, um, one of the most powerful things I think is to tell somebody and to make it anything that you can do to make like whatever you want to do, however you want to live more real, um, I think is so important because people can ask you about it. If you tell somebody, you know, you can look right. at that letter, like you said, and say, Hey, no, I'm really trying. I am actually stopping, um, this addiction. Like, I haven't just thought about it. I'm not just kind of halfway trying for a couple of days. Like this is real, you know, and it gets really important. Yep. Yeah. It's a scary place to be. It's a scary place to be sometimes when you make a decision like that yeah. big. It is. Cause like, I remember when I divorced my ex-wife, like that was a big decision. That was a huge decision. And I did have to face the fears of being alone or being, or thinking, oh, what are they going to think? You know, cause I'm, I'm a well-known, you know, Christian in the metal scene. And I got so much hate mail from Christians. It was amazing. I was like, 
Wow, that's so cool. I, I really appreciate that. That really shows me the unconditional love that Christ had on the cross for us. <laughs> um, thanks for reminding me of how great religion is. But um, sure. So like, I, I got, I had to face a lot of those fears. I had to face the fear of being the divorce guy. Um, I had to face the fear of thinking that, well, I'm never going to love somebody again, or I'm never going to let myself fall in love. Or um, I had to go through the process of finding the healing of some of the things that she had done so that I wouldn't put those things on the next person that I was in a relationship with. Oh man. Cause that's not yeah. okay to do either. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much stuff that, you know, goes along, the, along that way, but it's like, but at the end of the day, like, I understood that that was an unhealthy relationship on both accounts. I'm not, I'm not saying I was great and she sucked. We both sucked and we were both toxic for one another. Uh -huh. um, and I realized that that was just not good. At, I didn't want my life to be that way. And I didn't want her life to be that way. I didn't, you know, I, I think you just have to make that decision and go, okay, I'm about to make probably the best decision for my life right now. It's going to be difficult. So let me prepare. So like, if you want it today, if you were like, Hey, I'm going to put that blade down. I'm writing the letter. I'm doing it today. I don't, I know that this is not what I deserve and I need and want to love myself and I want to be better. Then start preparing, call your best friend, let them know, tell your parents, yeah. Tell, you know, go to hard support, write it out, like get the paper and pen and start writing your letter. Go on Amazon and look on books uh, about self-harm. Go ahead and pick up a copy of uh, Rewrite, which is our book on self-harm and like start to prepare yourself for this journey because like you deserve it. You deserve to not go to this anymore and be in this destructive relationship. And like have a divorce, divorce from this, from this traumatic and, and negative, you know, substance in your life yeah. or this addiction in your life um, and prepare yourself, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that that's so just the, the thought of being that person is so scary for a lot of people. Like I've lived my life. It's like we were talking about earlier. I've lived my life like this. And there's people in chat talking about like, man, I've been, I've been like self harming for like 13 years, you know, or like been addicted to pills or whatever for however long you've been doing life this way for such a long time. And to think of your life as being somebody who doesn't do these things, who isn't addicted, who isn't like leaning on that crutch every single day is so scary. So scary. How, how do we get over it? How do we like deal with that fear? What do you guys think? I mean, changing an identity, even if it's, even if it's part of that identity is one that, that you want to get away from, it's, you know, that's, that requires therapy and counseling a lot of times because it's, you, you have to have a whole new outlook. Like the way you see yourself is different. The way you, you feel when you walk into a room and, and even if other people can't immediately see it, you have a new identity. And so you have to be prepared to walk into a room feeling like a different person, you know, and I think uh, counseling and, and um, having a resource like HeartSport and people to talk to is, is so important because of that, because I mean, ima imagine, you know, if I tomorrow I woke up and I was no longer a, a, a guy in a metal band and I just walked in and I just went to a cubicle and, and you know, I cut my hair, cut my beard, and I, I just went there and I, and I started just programming and in, inputting numbers in the computer all day for, for eight hours a day. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily traumatic, but it would it would take me months to adjust to that, you know? And so mm -hmm. we're talking about traumatic things that are happening and how much more those shake up your identity. Um, I mean, so, I mean, you're having two things, you're having a traumatic substance that you're, you're dealing with and a total shake in your identity. And I think both of those things together really need all the resources they can get. Man, that's a great point. Like thinking about like, okay, what about a major change in your life that isn't traumatic? Think about how big of a deal that is, you know, and how long that would take and all the adjustment that it takes to deal with that. Um, and then this is even harder, you know, man. Yeah. But, but I don't want that to be a discouraging thing. 
Like, I don't want people to go, oh man, like this is going to take forever. Like I might as well give up because there's no point. Right. Like, that's not true. Like, mm -hmm. like yeah. when, as you go through the journey, you start to see your, your chains just come off. You start to like, for someone who's, uh, uh, abuse abusing alcohol like that drinks like a lot on a regular basis when you stop drinking and you're not waking up with the hangover for like a whole week you literally feel like a brand new person because you're like yeah why am i not hung over right now like yeah. or <laughs> why do i feel why do i have this extra energy or why did i you know why did i uh sure. you know do this or do that like you start to see these things and then you start to like food tastes better, or maybe you decide to try something you've never done before, like put your dog on your chest and ride a motorcycle, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, or maybe you pick up, like maybe you were painting like 12 years ago and you were, you loved painting and you haven't painted because you've been busy and you know, things have gotten crazy. And now instead of drinking, you spend hours painting or whatever it is, right? Like you start to see the change. And when you see the change, you desire more because you start to see the freedom. Your face looks better. Your 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 view of the world looks nicer and better. And your, your self-confidence or your self-love. And like, once you start to see those changes, it just encourages you that you're on the right path and to continue. And so don't think like it's going to take years of dreadingly getting away from this addiction of, of relationship that you're conditioned to love. Like, no, look at it as, dude, you're going to be better every day. Something new is going to happen. It's a, it's a new journey. It's a new life. You're not chained anymore. You know, and like your perspective changes. And so like, it's a good process. It's a exciting yeah. process, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's important. People need to hear that for sure. And they're, like another example from the recovery community is definitely a euphoric aspect to, to coming off of a substance. Like uh, as an example, um, you know, when somebody, somebody comes off of, uh, off of, of heroin for a certain amount of time and the receptors in their brain get reset, all of a sudden it's like, wow, like this is what clear thinking feels like. This is what having energy and motivation feels like. And your receptors, regardless of the addiction, you, you have receptors in your brain that are that are reacting to like whatever it is you're doing to your body. And when those get when those get cleared out and your body kind of gets restored to like if there's a physical element, like you're physiologically, when you are restored to the way your body is supposed to be, you're gonna just feel great. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And then life becomes your addiction. You get addicted to you know, the cool things in your life and the exciting, like, changes. And, you know, then you're like, oh, man, like, I'm pumped to just, like, live my life because my life rules. When versus before, it was like, oh, I need a drink because my life sucks. Sure. You know, and, like, you're just living through your, your addiction. And Jake, can we, can we get people to remotely join your a motorcycle club, which is basically anybody that puts their dog on their chest and rides their motorcycle? Yeah. That's... That's that's the Jake Lurs Motorcycle Club. Yeah. Wait, wait. Talk, talk I have right a question. In. I don't know if it's possible, but Dan, can you play the video that I sent you on the big screen? I I I can send that to Casey and we could do it, but <laughs> I don't know if we could do that right now. <laughs> okay. That's no but that is that's something uh, you can do in quarantine, right? You can still ride your motorcycle, right? It's just just you and your dog. Oh yeah, so, totally. So that's it. The I'm remotely joining the Jake Lurs Motorcycle Club. <laughs> uh, now all I have right, to get right. a motorcycle and a dog that likes me. <laughs> oh man, that's a lot. That's a lot of requirements. And <laughs> then you got to go out and buy one of those little front backpacks. And then I have to get the front back too. Yeah, the front back. Yeah, the front <laughs> back. Um, I think, uh, or the pack front. Um, I think that. <laughs> Uh, Tim, you need to get one of these. I'm going to send you the link on Amazon. To Amazon. <laughs> and and then you have to shoot a video of you like being like, what's up, guys? Uh, I'm part of this <laughs> motorcycle gang called the Dog Pack. Oh, my gosh. And, and then a video of you riding your Harley with uh, – yeah, with one of your dogs. That'd be great. Hey, this uh, this moment in time marks the the, uh, the start of, of 
it's, it's a historic moment right now. There we go. <laughs> there we go, guys. You heard it here first. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh curious. What's the point curious. of the stream? Does, does anyone on the stream that's that's listening, watching right now, does anyone else have a motorcycle and a small dog? <laughs> All right. I'm I, can't, I can't see the stream personally. Yeah, give us a, give us a seems good uh, right now if you have a motorcycle and a small dog. <laughs> or a really big motorcycle and a big dog. That oh, also yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That'd be great. Or a pocket bike and the smallest dog possible. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unicycle and hamster. There you, you could go. probably do that. Any kind of yeah. wheeled animal combination is fine. <laughs> Roller plates and a gerbil. <laughs> oh, man, I got skates and a possum. There we go. A possum. Nice. Please, please be safe. Don't bring woodland creatures on on vehicles with you. Um, so this is a question for me. Understanding that, how often do you guys do this? So we stream uh, three days a week: Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, for two to three hours. And Casey and I both both have uh, personal channels that we stream on as well. Casey does like a motivation, self care uh, slash gaming channel, and I do um, art and gaming on my channel. Very cool. Uh, I know this is not necessarily related to hardcore, but I I just finally got my first uh, game set up now, so I'm I'm slowly Ooh. creeping my way in. Are Very you going cool. to be streaming on Twitch, Tim? I, I I I would need some help to figure out how to even do that. But uh, hello, I would. We would like to help I have you. An incredibly yeah, convenient yeah. video uh, to send you, sir. Wait, oh, awesome. we have some. Cool. Tim, what what system and what game? What are we talking uh, here? I yeah. just I, I just did a um just a Windows 10 and uh and then I have an emulation of all the the, the older systems. So like I'm I'm going through my little nostalgic thing right now. I've, yeah, I've been dude. playing all the like. Arcade games, I guess they're called MAMEs, like oh, on, yeah. on Windows 10, and uh, have all those emulators. But then, of course, I have like the PlayStation stuff, and then uh, and since it's Windows, uh, anything Xbox. Yeah, dude. Cool. That's sick, dude. man. Well, I'm ripping PS4 with uh, I rip Shell, uh, NHL 20 with the boys every night. Nice. And I rip uh, COD, the new Call of Duty Warzone, which is free, and that's cross platform compatible so like if you ever want to get online one night let's say you have an xbox or you got your computer yeah, you can yeah. play that game even though i have a ps4 yeah That's so I, I have uh and and just so that because this is like how new i am to this i bought one xbox controller and one playstation controller and i synced them both so that like depending on which game i'm playing i could just grab the other controller because that's, that's the cool part about from my understand using like a windows based setup is that you can just switch between consoles pretty easily so that's rad sweet very yeah. cool Sick. i love it so, so cool. <laughs> just well, learning though i spent like like three days just like getting it all set up and then i have like a little bit a little bit of ocd to where like when it comes to the vintage games i had to like have the entire catalog of like like nes games and stuff you know yeah so i was like spent like you know half a day just loading up all these vintage games and only play like a third of them you know so. yeah do you get the, the the you know they have like USB based like you know NES controllers and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I've been using my Xbox controller to play Nintendo, but uh, but I eventually want to get some of the like the retro wow like USB controllers. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, That's so good. I just bought a uh, a Sega Genesis off of eBay because that was like my jam when I was when I was a little little kid. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Sick. I played I played Altered Beast uh, two days ago. Oh, nice. <laughs> Sick. Anyway. All right, enough of that. But yeah, it's cool. I'm I'm just uh just learning. I got a lot to learn. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, we it's all cool. do with everything. It's cool. <laughs> um guys, uh thank you so much for for coming by. Um we're we're going to let you guys go, but uh it's been been awesome to hang out and yes. talk about things that people don't normally talk about and uh really yeah. Just lo love and respect you guys a lot. So thank you for being our guests. I love you guys, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Appreciate you boys. Love you. Awesome. Thank you. 
Well, um, to everybody on uh, stream, we're going to be on uh, just Dan and I um, talking more about uh, mental health and stuff. If you guys want to share some about your life, uh, maybe stuff that you've heard on uh, this stream, you want to open up about stuff, you have something completely unrelated you want to talk about, um, we'll be here for another hour hanging out with you guys. Um, so don't go away, all right? Because we'll just miss you too much. All right? That's right. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, we'll catch you later. All right. Thanks, guys. See you. See you. Bye, bro.